Time now for today's perspective segment, and we can speak to computational scientist Orly Jean. Thank you for coming into French Thank 24 you. today. Uh, Orly Jean is the author of the book, On the Other Side of the Machine, A Scientific Journey in the Land of Algorithms. It's already making my head spin. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of different angles to take this. I just want to say, does it sound like hyperbole that science is in this unique position nowadays to either save the world or perhaps ruin it, the way it's being politicized? <laughs> Well, that, yeah, well, I think it's always been like that, you know, about scientists or anyone who, um, who is a leader in something. So now it's about technology, computational technologies. And in fact, yes, you're right. I mean, you can as much as um, create something amazing or, or doing something bad, but uh, not only scientists, by the way, so, so people are using those technologies and algorithms. Well, from the scientific perspective, what are some of the challenges coming from this? I know with like art artificial intelligence, there's a lot of discussion about the bias. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the real threat today, I would say, is the algorithm biases, you know, which is literally, we have cognitive biases and we tend to transfer those biases to the technologies we build, algorithms that we write and implement in codes. And so, yes, biases, we've seen, you know, in the past few years, some concrete cases of algorithm biases like discrimi technology discrimination, like, for instance, for uh, facial recognition algorithm that didn't recognize um, black people or other kind of biases, like the Apple Card um, uh, application that we've seen recently, like in the past, in the past maybe a couple of months ago, like where the algorithm was actually providing very low uh, credit line to women compared to men. And well, it, what, what would explain these two sort of uh, uh, shortcomings? I mean, if they're not recognizing black people or providing low credit line to women, is that intentionally being written into the code or is it some sort of <laughs> oversight? Well, I hope it's not. And <laughs> also, no, it's not. So in fact, the, uh, in the case of the, um, the facial recognition algorithm, it's because two different origins. First, maybe the, the explicit criteria of the algorithm were not considering black tones, you know, so skin based on the image analysis and contrast of images, things like that. And also because maybe um, the algorithm was, the implicit part of the algorithm was not trained over, I mean, was trained over a set of data of white people mostly, so which obviously biased eventually the, um, the technology. Okay, now, excuse my ignorance on the topic. No, please. Is implicit uh, the same as artificial intelligence here? No, uh, okay, yes. Yeah. So artificial intelligence is implicit and explicit. Explicit is literally when you write the algorithm, everything, you know, the criteria, the equations, the uh, assumptions, things like that. The implicit part is when the algorithm is trained over the data, meaning that the uh, criteria are not explicitly defined by the human, but implicitly defined by the training process. So it's very different. So uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's very important to say that there is the explicit part and the implicit part. Usually people tend to think that it's only the training, but in fact there is also you know, the, the, all the traditional artificial intelligence that's still going on, and we still to work on that too. Yeah. And algorithms themselves, you might like to think of them as modern. Most people probably associate the term with Google, but they're actually go back centuries. Absolutely. It's a very good point. I mean, people think about algorithms as computer algorithms, the ones that are in Google, for instance, the ones that are made to be implemented in the code to run on a computer. But in reality, algorithms are very old, you know, and they, are where they were actually traditionally made to be um, written by hand, you know. And I talk about that in the book because the first algorithm that I developed, um, the first, maybe 10, 20 algorithms. You were that I 23 did, at the time? I was 19, 19. actually. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, still young. But I was actually uh, writing those algorithms by hand, you know, with a paper and pencil. So, you know, just it's good to, to, to give perspectives to people and realize that algorithms are not new, you know, so it's important. Now, part of the challenge is dealing with people perhaps like me who aren't very familiar with the matter, and this might be politicians who are policymakers. Yeah, it's a um, very good point, uh, yeah, which is to me a real challenge. You were asking me which, which challenge um, we need to face. This is one of them, which is that um, the lawmakers or people, the... Uh, politicians, you know, those people really need to understand how it works a minimum. You know, obviously they don't need to be an expert or to be good in math. It's not the, the goal, but the objective. But they really need to understand the underlying mechanisms to be able to make the right decision and also to be able to, um, to talk to the right people to understand how it works and to write correct laws as regulations uh, as well as develop the right vision. Do you see a divide between how the U.S., I mean, with Silicon Valley, has handled things versus here in Europe? Well, um, 
It's it's um it's very different. Even though you know we had the GDPR in Europe, and we've seen recently with the um, California Consumer Privacy Act that that was inspired by the GDPR that we have some kind of influence, you know, uh, on Europe to the United States. That being said, we um, there is still differences, obviously. But look, I mean, in San Francisco, for instance, they just banned the um, like a few months ago they banned the facial recognition within the city, you know, on the streets. So. You know, I think we are more close. We are more close, closer than what we think. You know, in general. Yeah. Uh, there have been a number of prominent crises mm -hmm. recently. There's the discussion about fake news being circulated yeah. on social media. There's a question about privacy data in Cambridge Analytica. Um, is this science evolving too quickly for democracy? Um, you know, it's a tough question because uh, when you talk about fake news, you should talk about also about deep fakes, which is a big issue today. You know, because it's going to be better and better, and we're, we're going to have a hard time to detect. Images where we think someone is exactly. saying something, but it's Which actually a Which is a real fake. threat, yes. you know, to democracy, obviously. So um, uh, I think we need to be very careful, and the solutions are not only technology-based, you know, so we have to look for it, but uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a real threat, and we need to work on that. And we need also to collaborate between countries, you know, to find solutions and to go to the same goal. It sounds simple on paper, but it never really is, is it? And, and I mean, one of yeah. the arguments that they give in capitalist societies is that regulation stifles creativity. A lack of regulation leads to companies uh, abusing their power. Oh, yeah. What's the trade-off? What's the right trade-off? You know, it's a matter of balance. You know, that's why regulations, when they're well made, they can actually encourage, you know, innovation. But if they are not made well, obviously it's it's an issue. And this is a matter of balance. And the balance is that's why I really I, I write about that in the book, meaning that I really say that the lawmakers really need to work closely, you know, with the people who are doing those algorithms, like scientists, engineers, developers, you know, because those people know how it works and they might have insightful information on how, you know, to write those laws or mostly like uh, which elements should be important when describing, for instance, how you erase data? What does it mean to erase data? You know, this kind of thing. So it's really need to be a, collab a close collaboration to, um, to develop the right regulations at the right time. Uh, quick question for you. The U.S. is holding its Democratic nomination process. Some of the candidates there discuss about breaking up big tech, these uh -huh. big co tech companies. Would that be something that would send a shockwave through the industry, or would that be something that you think would be a good idea? You know, I didn't, uh, I didn't think about it, so I need to think more deeply, you know, about that. But, um, but I'm gonna. Follow. I don't have any answer right now. You know, uh, I need to think more about it. But for sure, those big tech companies have responsibilities, you know, and they have to really understand that responsibilities towards the country where they work, towards people, um, yeah, towards freedom and and, and democracy. So real quickly, what's your outlook in a one word for 2020? Will things improve compared to 2019 or? Uh, well, more I hope that what's going to improve is the understanding of people about technology, you know. Yeah. OK. All right. Thank you very much. Orly Jean, a computational scientist. Her book, uh, A Journey Through the Land of Algorithms and Machine on the Other Side. Thank you very much. Thank you. France 24. Time now for a reminder of our top stories here on the news program. OK, uh, the uh, coronavirus outbreak sees an increase in deaths and cases in mainland China. Meanwhile, a large number of Americans evacuated from a quarantine ship in Japan. Syrian regime makes major gains in Aleppo, seizing most of the rebel-controlled province. The fighting comes on the eve of new talks between Russia, who supports the rebels, and Turk uh, Russia, who supports the government, and Turkey, who backs the rebels. 